This is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience Podcast. We humans love our tribes. If you're in my tribe, you're granted an element of trust and acceptance, even value. If you're out of my tribe, you rarely receive that status, almost certainly not with equal value. When COVID pushed us all into remote work, an accidental consequence occurred. On-premises workers and remote workers all got pushed into the same tribe. We sat there looking at each other from the same piece of glass, like a Zoom version of the Brady Bunch. No one was perceived to have more value as a worker or a leader because of their geographical location, which, let's face it, before the pandemic, if you worked remotely, you were perceived to be less valuable and effective. This pandemic petri dish demonstrated being in the room didn't make you a better or worse employee or leader. Being skilled was the difference. This week, I'm joined by Sarah Keller. Sarah is the head of global technology sourcing and supply chain at Uber. Prior to Uber, she worked for organizations like Meta, Workday, and Google, just a few small groups. Sarah brings a powerful perspective to this conversation and the complexities of remote opportunity among return to work directives, an area that requires thoughtful and serious consideration. So please enjoy the conversation with Sarah Keller. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data, how we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS experience. Three, two, one. Sarah, I love your story. Can you update us on, because it's, it's this curious journey. You did not wake up one day as a young woman saying, you know what? I'm going to go take over the data center world. How, how did you, how did you end up in this role? Oh, wow. Um, well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I would say, you know, this, there's a story of, of following your interests and not being afraid of, of challenge or, or maybe taking a different path. You know, if I had, if I had followed paths that had been defined for me 20 years ago, would I be where I'm at today? Definitely not mm. for sure. Uh, but for those who don't know me or haven't heard anything about me, I started off um, not knowing what I was going to do, ended up in business um, as a business major. If for no other reason, then I just assumed if you were getting paid, some learning how business operated didn't change the fact that you're going to get paid for something. Mm. It, it wouldn't have mattered if I was an artist. It wouldn't have mattered if I was you know, a technologist. It, it was like the most universal degree I could get. Which I think has actually been true because there there are foundations that I learned in those undergraduate classes that still apply today. Um, but I would just say started off um, doing work in international standards, uh, did some early data center standards work. Uh, so I learned the data center side from I hate to admit it, but grid uh, grid <clears throat> technology. Uh -huh. um, XML based data center markup language. They were trying to figure out a way to come create standardization for how to configure security, how to do network. I'm not going to age myself by saying this, but anyone who wants to look at it can look <laughs> at the Oasis Open uh, submissions and what we did on that side. But it would just it gave this this viewpoint of a technology space that was like a wild west, mm. and I and I loved it. In fact, I I kind of went from that to a more traditional IT program management office at Google, um, where I was hired to build up a, a TPM group that was managing everything from corpnet builds to, you know, IT socks. You know, it was a very broad spectrum. Um, and here's the place where that departure really happened because each one of those jobs was super disconnected. Mm. But then I got offered a, a role in the supply chain <laughs> team, early supply chain team at Facebook, now Meta. Um, and I remember distinctly, like the hiring manager wanted me in the role. And I was like, I don't know how to negotiate. Like, how, how would that even make sense? Like, right. you should be hiring people who truly know this. And she was like, no, I need people who understand people and how to work with engineering. And, you know, and that became a very critical because, of course, in the standards world and even the work that I had done at Google, it was all about how do I make engineering optimized? How do I get things done faster? How do we deliver the thing we said we were going to deliver as efficiently as possible? So supply chain wasn't that big of a jump from that. If you start really thinking about the, the building block components of it. And I think from a negotiation perspective, she was right because I found myself, I always thought negotiation was this like wild west show, 
you know, where you got two people standing on the end of a street and there was a fight. There was like, this is, and that was not who I was like from a nature, like this felt um, antagonistic. And I was like, I'm not antagonistic. Why would I comfortably walk into something that feels like I'm on two sides of a table and you're both trying to like do the best to screw the other person, right? Right. Like that was my impression. And I feel like now if you were to ask, well, how did I get to where I am? Like if I, if I had failed out early on in that negotiation story, uh, would I have gone back, back into TPM or some other sort of organizational management? I probably But I think the right answer was, I found that most people come into work wanting to do a good job. Like most people want to just solve problems. So whether you are on the data center provider side today, right? Or let's say you're coming from some other environment, you are trying to deliver the best you possibly can. And I found like, if you start from that baseline, and I'm not saying that there aren't outliers, right? That there aren't people who come in with a chip on their shoulder or really aren't very good at their role. But even with those people, you can still find that if you start with that baseline of everybody is trying to just do the best they can to do a good job, then you create a normalization of what we're trying to accomplish. And then you start talking about, well, what does good look like? And and when you start moving from a place like that, one, it becomes really easy to get things done, get things done efficiently, to allow for things to happen in an organic way where you're not creating a forcing factor. But you also come from a place of respect. And I feel like, you know, where do I, where I'm at today came from years of, of respect where I was respectful to people. And people responded in a similar manner. Um, you mentioned an acronym in, acronym in there, TPM. I'm presuming that's technical project manager. Is that what it is for people Correct. who don't know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, what you, where you ended there just a second ago, um, you know, what does good look like? It reminds me of, I remember an executive coming back from an executive retreat. And he said the keynote speaker there was a pastor church pastor at this executive. It was not a religious thing. Was, um, but part of that um, executive leadership uh, discussion was, how do we insert or start with trust instead of suspicion? If we start mm-hmm. off with a, um, if a, you know, we, first of all, have we defined the parameters? And if a parameter is not met, why? Let's start first with not incompetency, Let's start with trust. There's a reason why, whether it's uh, – he would list the list of reasons they didn't understand, the parameters weren't defined, whatever, some circumstance, <clears throat> and let's work from that. As opposed to – which was wildly surprising to him, not that a member of the clergy was doing that, but just that that's not the school – he came from the school of two gung fighters, you know, kind of the 1960s madmen or even 80s, I guess, Wolf of Wall Street caricature of everybody's got to lose. You know, we say win-win, but that's not really what we would mean. We mean um, uh, we strong arm our quote unquote partner or our customer into a um, position. And because we have the unique thing, either they're the unique buyer I need, or I've got the unique product that they need. Somehow I just, uh, I won. And um, it, 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 so anyway, that was very, um, that was very interesting to him on how to how do we work through that. So, but anyway, that's what it reminded me of. How m- m- the other? I guess my comment is, I know a number of people that are going to be listening to this gonna say, "Wow, that's a pedigree to start and go to Google, and then to uh, where'd you say uh, now Meta?" Well, it, yeah, it was it, so I was an EXT at Google <clears throat> building uh-huh. up a TPM at a time mm-hmm. when they could not hire resources. <clears throat> like <clears throat> it was, a, it was a specific time at Google. Like now, right. there's a very different culture. But like when I was there, ERS had like a seven degree flavor. If you couldn't show seven levels of progression in someone's career, they couldn't hire you. And so they treat it. So it was like these, it was this weird hybrid role where it's like, you're not an employee because they couldn't hire you to be an employee. So I had like these professionals on the team that were like industry leaders in specific spaces, Mm -hmm. but because they couldn't show more than two degrees of growth because they were already coming in as too senior or they just didn't have that natural flow in engineering, Google couldn't hire them. 
Wow. So it's very different than today's EXT kind of population. But it, I started off there, right. went to Meta. Now that was full time. Right. Then I was at Workday and then started at Uber about a little over seven years ago. And it was like me and one dude responsible <laughs> for all of the technology buying of the company <clears throat> in a wild west when it was in right. massive. Sure. Right. We had multiple data centers in China, we had multiple data centers in the US. You had engineers who were like literally signing quotes with PDFs. Like, I mean, like it was crazy, um, crazy town trying to just. It wasn't even about efficiency at that point. It was just like wrangling cats to just bring it all together to understand like the complexity of what we were trying to build and the type of product we had and where we were trying to really bring kind of technology to help us versus mm -hmm. like we just need to consume as much as we possibly can to deliver, you know, the product that we do. I always remember we've, we, not on that scale, but we are very entrepreneurial and kind of chaotic here the first number of years to think that we're uh we i guess the only official number i can say is we got bought and went from pri public to private for 10 billion a little over a year and a half ago and we've probably doubled would be my unprofessional uninformed guess since then um <clears throat> from this little data center uh that we started here in uh the atlanta metro area it's crazy but you that reminds me of I heard a Lex Friedman podcast. I don't know if you've ever heard Lex. He's one of my favorite, but he had one of the original engineers at Apple on there. And they were mm -hmm. talking about those eras of Apple, the beginning. He was one of the original chip manufacturers there. And the chaos of it, and part of it was hard. Part of Steve's personality was hard. But Lex said, do you think that's a feature or um, a bug? And he said, oh, it's a feature, this, this chaos. He's like, why? Because you don't have energy without chaos. Like, you have to put enough bureaucracy on it so you don't, you know, accelerate yourself into the cliff, but not so much that you kill the energy and kill the direction. And so some of that is a rapper you have to put around certain personalities, Steve's being one of them, and he recognized that eventually. And But these other things, but you get too heavy with bureaucracy, you kill the momentum, you kill the energy, you don't have enough, and you just run off the rails everywhere. But it's that, that high energy. I look back in fondness most of the time um, with those eras of kind of there's energy and we're figuring it out and um, the bureaucracy hadn't caught up yet. And, you know, mistakes are made in those eras. So you got to add all of the the guardrails get closer and closer. And then they get kind of restricted. And are like, man, I wish I had the good old days. No, they were just chaos. But it was, you know, it's fun. Was, was, the, um, was the vibe the same without naming the other companies specifically? Or were they in different growth modes where it wasn't as chaotic and figure it out? So... It, that's an interesting question. And and I would tell you, because I, I would say, if people were to ask me, like, what I look for, I, I'm a builder. I really mm. am. I found that I'm not good at the sustain the business. Um, I'm That's not a place of interest for me. Um, in fact, frankly, I left um, the company before Uber and Workday, mm. primarily because it was in a sustain mode. It was mm -hmm. like, you just need a buyer. The strategy right. is pretty well set. We we <clears> built the tool, we built the team, we built the process. Once those pieces were done, and I was very fast, right? Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, it was not um, difficult because they, they lived in a structured place. Mm -hmm. And again, if you think about a SaaS business, they require a significant amount of, like anybody who's using Workday, to be honest, is going mm -hmm. to have to develop like an internal migration strategy. So the ramping for capacity, if you start thinking from an infrastructure perspective, was on these really long lead times. So it's like you have six to 12 months to land the equipment for something that was sold today, mm -hmm. right? Now, in, in the data center market, pre-COVID mm -hmm. or pre this crazy growth spurt, you know, maybe you could pull that off if the inventory was available, you could get it done in like three to four months, right. but you're still pressing to make four months happen, <clears throat> right? Like that's keeping all the cellulanders running all at the same time. Right. So, and I would say even on the IT stack, what was going into the white center, frankly, like most OEM equipment, et cetera, you could get in four months or less. So mm -hmm. even in a super optimized place, you know, to have a year to plan to deliver something is a very different pressure than, let's say, like when I was at Facebook, Meta now, mm -hmm. 
I started and it was like the data centers were running at 95% capacity. We were burning up capacity faster than we could build it. Right. And that's not building as in how they build today, Tom's, you know, big efforts and, and the beautiful right. work that they do for custom data centers. <clears throat> I'm literally talking about your traditional colos, just like you have today, right. just could not get built fast enough. Uh, we couldn't keep the wheels on fast enough. You know, there were those like, hey, if I don't get this online, certain parts of the product will stop working, right? right. There was a pressure cooker attached to that. Um, I would say Uber felt a little more like that. Mm. than necessarily, you know, where the work day I had all the time in the world and I right. could be very, like, I could be very sophisticated <clears throat> and mature and standardized and, right. like, do all of these cool things. It was, like, early on, it was, like, just get it in the box and in and, and, and the door and powered up as fast as you possibly can because we're not at the place we need to be. But we were also growing, and we still continue to grow a similar clip uh, with the exception of the dip in 2020, it's about 30% year over year right. since I started. So at that clip, you know, from an infrastructure growth, if you're just thinking about it in raw metrics, you know, we and we've we've gotten quite a bit more that we were supporting than where I started off, which was right. just the writer driver app. Now we right. have multiple products we're supporting with that same infrastructure. Well, I'm learning about those multiple products. I want to talk about them in a little bit. Um, in a weird way, your description there reminded me of prayer. There are times when like, it's all good. I'm, I'm feeling blessed. Things are going okay. And this is not a religious podcast, but I just think, you know, oh, Lord, how art thou? I, <laughs> the trees and the, like, it's whatever. And then the other day, my um, 22-year-old daughter, very independent, goes to school uh, about an hour away, called. Um, I know she... I know it's going to go sideways when she calls me and says, Papa, I need your help. She, she doesn't usually start with that. And it's 10 o'clock at night and she's on the side of a mountain road. And like, I'm, I'm imagining all of the worst, you know, circumstances. And it turned out it was just fine. It was no big deal. She was actually at a storage unit and the car just wouldn't start. The battery gone dead. <clears throat> but I'm in, you know, my prayer then is, you know, night, Lord, angel army, protect that kid. I'm on the way. Like you just, you know, your, uh, your situation changes and it's, um, uh, I, I wonder now in this world, if you don't just maybe just segue a little bit, how do you, how do you lead? And let me just, just take a minute, but just, so you've been through these three or four different groups. And one of the things we didn't talk much about was there's a pandemic at the end of that, that in addition to being part of organizations that are growing, like really no industry we know of, certainly since the railroads, but I would, most of us would argue even way more so than the railroads for a variety of reasons, this explosion, explosion of growth. Now the growth is in markets that are much more difficult than um, either existing markets with more regulation, regulation or new markets without the infrastructure, you've got all of this going on, you got a pandemic, like how, how has your leadership, as you imagine being a leader in the new world, in this new world order, in a, you know, a high, what we would call a hyperscale company, one of these top 30 buyer IT companies on earth, maybe we can just start off that conversation, like how's that whole dynamic changed? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because for me, I feel like there's a, there was a major growth that <clears> happened <throat> for me at Uber. And, and I'm not going to suggest it's, um, it's you know, obviously it's the product you're scaling and different things you're doing mm. different, you know, data centers in China. Anyone wants to talk data centers in China, I am your girl Friday. Like <laughs> I had to learn that. And that is one of those places where like you would never have expected it to be so different. Like you knew it was different, but you didn't know how different it really was. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking from a technical perspective. I think on a personal growth and again, not to double down mm -hmm. on the spiritual side, but just to kind of frame it around where what some big lessons I learned from my own personal leadership, but then also how we talk about team dynamics. So for me, there is this place where I kind of connected to, do I need another brand or logo on my resume, right? So I think as individuals, mm -hmm. people tend to kind of play the grass is always greener 
or it'll be better when I'm at company N or if I have this type of logo and I have incredible logos. So to your point about like these, these different tech brands, et cetera, and like the, the perspective is like, I'm not, my career isn't growing because I throw another logo on it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so then it was also this place of like, well, okay, I know I'm a builder. Okay, cool. So I can go to startups all over the world and, and go do building, but that's not, that's not what I'm interested in. In fact, Uber had, frankly, this massive meltdown in 2017, very public, right? Our CEO left as a result of it. Uh, we lost a lot of our executive staff. You know, it wasn't a great culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole badness of it, right. but what I would just say is <clears throat> like structurally, I found myself at odds with the culture with, with which I was working on, but I, I really believed in what I was building. And I believed in the power of the platform and the product. And I really liked a lot of the people I worked with. So it's like, it was this weird dichotomy of like very toxic bro culture, mm -hmm. but finding so many other things that were like super positive. I had never been in that place in my career before, mm. right? I left like one of the nicest companies to work for. If you look at all of the reports, mm -hmm. you know, Workday is considered one of the best places, nicest people mm -hmm. to literally work for, um, a company that had such a terrible tech bro reputation, even before 2017 blew mm. up, that it was one of those, like, it didn't make sense. Uh, family members are like, are really? Like, you, you're going to do that? Like, why would you do that? But I, I had confidence <clears throat> in, like I said, the people, mm. power of platform. I'm a huge believer in if you know the product and you know what it can be capable of, you can connect to that story in a way that I don't think any management speak or, or internal marketing could ever give you, right? Like you can't force like a connection to a product or to a company. I think it happens organically or it doesn't because it's organic. And this is a leadership lesson I've learned, not about specific companies, but advice that I give to my employees comes from this place of like, if you don't believe on some level in what you're doing, and, and that may not be coming from salary that may not be coming from cash like a cash perspective from equity that may not be what the external market tells you this company is going to be that may not be title none of those things actually mean anything because you end up at the wrong company even if you are a senior level getting paid extremely well and doing You're wrong behavior i might say yeah. yeah you it won't matter you're not really <clears throat> you're not there right you're not really a part of that and so my advice to people truly is if you're if you're leaving to go on a mission or to go on a side journey, by all means, do it with heart, because <laughs> otherwise you're not going to actually be aligned. And that alignment means you're just going to jump like frog jump to the next thing and the next thing. And that grass isn't greener. You means you're always going to end up facing the same problem, which almost always is you like <laughs> how you perceive things and how you've attached to your story comparative to like a reality state. And I think people will track that. Like people end up getting themselves in that same situation over and over again, not realizing that it isn't tech. It isn't like you have a bad picker. It is right. quite literally what you are doing as you continue to index off the wrong like points, right? right. You're, you're making decisions off of the wrong thing. So that was a huge, because that's part of why I hate to say I stayed through the meltdown, mm -hmm. but it was one of those places like if I could still believe and I still saw the power, I still saw like progress, I could suffer through anything. My grandma used to have a saying, which is like, you can deal with anything if you understand it, mm -hmm. right? Like you can live with any situation. And I kind of understood that like in a real sense, in a very practical sense, Coming out of the pandemic, though, we had, you know, I my heart goes out for everybody who's going through the tech uh, layoffs right now. Um, this is is a terrible time. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that all of these people look at this as like that next, like that jump that pushed them into that next big thing for themselves or put them into a place where they're super successful now mm -hmm. um, or will be super successful in that next gig. But we had, like, my team was impacted pretty heavily in 2020 um, because it was all cost-oriented. And mm. I think a lot of the layoffs that are happening today are also cost-oriented. So they take the highest cost performers and they're like, well, if they can say, hey, I'm, I'm slowing down servers, well, then why do I pay for these headcounts or et cetera? Right. So 
it was a numbers based view versus like based off of performance or based off of like what individual teams need or don't need. They just take a slice of the dice and then run it all the way through. As a leader, that's really difficult because I ended up having to rehire versions of those same roles. Like my team was like, I lost 20% of the team. Actually, by the end of the year, I had gained. So it was like I had gone up 2% over where right. I started the year. So you have to fire people to then rehire in different kind of capacities. You have to reorg around it and then still be going while still keeping the lights on. Right. So this is this was a lesson in itself, too, because it's to, if you think management is making poor decisions, generally speaking, they're coming from such a peanut buttered mindset. They don't look at the specifics. The best you can do is just adapt. Right. So if I got really caught in that unfairness or as a leader, like, you know, I told you that this would break. And then the moment that these people were gone, it broke. And then all of a sudden you said, oh, sorry, sorry. Here's the, here's that, the head count again. You know, I could have got really in my own head about all of that and really upset about it, but I just accepted where it was. Cause like, I think again, it comes down to accepting reality. Like mm -hmm. you can't fight reality. You're always going to end up on the losing side of it. Right. Um, but I will say one positive thing that I really saw come from the, from coming out of COVID and the this place of like trying to create team dynamic where you don't have the natural infrastructure you're not whiteboarding together you're not going out for you know team happy hours or team events you have to create different type of leadership structure i saw this really positive thing happen because it mm -hmm. used to be if you weren't in the corporate office you were a second class citizen Right. Like if headquarters was in Dallas or in the case of, of Uber in San Francisco, there was always this permeation of power kind of ring that kind of comes from that, which is like the closer you are to, let's say, the heart or the mind of the mm -hmm. company, it, the more it is your career can advance, the more you have like visibility, the more that you can get things done. Um, and the further out you are in the ring, the more likely you are to be subjected to like, well, you're specific or your specialty or you're you're not part of the core mission in a specific way. Right. Um, I saw the change. And this is like that other eye opening, like, I hope I never lose this going out of or the pandemic now that we're kind of returning to normal. Because <clears throat> when I saw leaders on my team that were not based on how like like a headquartered kind of mindset that like just raised to the challenge, like really delivered, um, just grew exponentially. Invisibility wasn't difficult to give them because frankly, they were just killing it on themselves and people weren't second guessing. Well, why would you, you know, have elevated this to someone in Brazil or someone in, you know, India or, you know, someone not in the local office. It used to be like, well, maybe you just aren't thinking this is, uh, sufficiently critical enough. So you'd have to put somebody here, even if someone was doing like the like work in India, like there, you, there was this mindset that was, well, that's, if you're subbing it out, then you don't think of it as strategic, which is in and of itself a broken concept, right? I saw leaders show up at all levels of the org, all levels, at lo all locations of the company. I'd be able to elevate people into roles. I'm not getting questioned on the why of it. Whereas mm -hmm. before the pandemic, and I hate to say it, it's like slightly racist in some ways or some mm -hmm. slightly biased in some ways. I mean, I do think that it was there, but mm -hmm. there was this place of, I actually think it was, if I'm not seeing you in the white <clears throat> of the eye in the elevator, then you've given me somebody who isn't critical. Mm -hmm. And so then it was always like, well, then I had, I was forced to keep people into these like lower level roles, even if their skills, their aptitude and their desire was much higher. That's changed. And right. I love that part. It is, uh, there's, there's so many things there that it, that resonate. One is, I think it is true because it's human nature. You, we have systems that have been in place for millennia, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, whatever culture you go to, whether it's a patriarchal, matriarchal, it's based upon your skin color, your gender, whatever it is, all of them have some value to the local tribe. And look, if you're defending against saber-toothed tigers and marauders coming over the hill, um, there's a lot of value to knowing 
I can really trust this person whose cook pot is right outside my door and they're right here in my thing and I see them every day and I know, you know, I'm counting if they miss them, if they miss a hunt or if they miss a, a harvest or whatever, we're all in serious trouble or if they're treating an illness. So that, so we, we've kind of come by this naturally, this, this thing. Um, <clears throat> we're not as quick many times to adapt when technology allows us to expand our tribe. Our tribe may not have the same skin color or the same gender or the same accent. What I heard somebody say, I don't know why today's church theme, I don't even know why. I apologize to my listeners, but it it just (laughs) resonates with this. And it was, I heard somebody say, look, if you have the same faith system as somebody else, you whatever that is you 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 worship in uh, Tibet you whatever you have a you've just inherited a lot in common regardless of whether you kneel in Little Rock Arkansas or in um, the Saharan Desert or whatever you have a lot in common and so when you were talking about earlier how you discover these people that aren't in your um, zip code or area code. And yet they buy into this belief that you talked about before that, like, we're all in, we get to be builders. Yeah, it's chaotic. You didn't have to bug me to stay online or to get up early or, yeah, I know I've got bed head while I'm on this call, but check it out. I solved this problem and here we're, and we're virtually high-fiving and people are in. Well, now they're your tribe. And what we're able to do now is, in a way, sort of break that, get a paradigm shift and start chipping away at these traditional models and say, look, what aligns us is maybe not our faith, but it's our belief in this thing that we're about. And so, um, yeah, you might have to suffer through a little bit of a different accent or a little bit different look or whatever. Those are all superficial things anyway. Our heart and our effort and our buying into what we're about is, is the big thing. And then I will just end with this. What gives me hope with that is to the degree that that becomes true and in it, and it expands, one, it helps to deal with a supply chain of people issue, which is one of the biggest issues. But what other boundaries can it help tear down? Because we, our tribes, we love our boundaries and we talk about them on occasion, whether they're boundaries of age or gender or ethnicity or religion or whatever they are. If I can get people to realign around this big belief system, and now they're no longer considered other, they're considered part of us and who we are, <clears throat> hopefully we can then have a strong impact on those other artificial boundaries. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I, that's kind of what I got as you were talking. That's how I was resonating with that. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, I if there was a point... Um, I don't know, early on before return to work, where I was like, this blows the roof on everything. Like I, I can find the talent I need anywhere in the world. And as long as we can agree on like working hours, right? Like if we can, if we can create like a, a real concept around time frame, and someone's willing to work like a like the equivalent of like a swing shift, right? Mm-hmm. Then then it's you don't lose some of the time gap issues, Mm -hmm. right. That can come from either having teams that are, you know, overseas or having kind of support resources that are, you know, coming from like a different geography. Cause that normally was the thing that people would get most upset about is like, well, if I have to wait for someone and it's 24 hour lead time, you know, I'm not, how fast am I really solving for this? So I was hopeful we would just blow it open as, as a, as an organizational leader who has a budget, you yeah. know, it's really difficult to keep yourself in budget. If you're trying to find the right talent and you also need to take it to a talent hub like San Francisco, right? right. You're competing for a lot of the same resources <clears throat> as a lot of my cloud friends are. Um, I don't have like, you know, again, you, you're trying to maybe compete for someone who is looking for a brand or logo, right? right. Whereas I, I'm like, again, I don't have that, but I understand that as a need for right. an applicant. And so as we were going through, um, I was hopeful that that was going to be like this whole new world order, like leaders can show up anywhere, we can hire whoever, as long as we can agree on a common foundation. I think to a certain degree, we were able to get some squeaks on that. We now see which return to office. There's now more com- like 
like, well, you can't hire someone remote. Now it has to be out of a talent hub. Mm -hmm. Talent hubs expand a little bit mm -hmm. um, in definition, but it's it's a little disappointing because I think it's a missed opportunity. And particularly mm -hmm. when I talk to my peers and, you know, like my husband is, is an engineering leader and it was like, it really was one of those like, hey, we could be, <clears throat> like the world could be a very different type of working relationship because we've proven remote work works like right. people are productive teams are productive right now i think the return to office you know just on that very personal level i think there's a lot of reasons why companies are doing this including frankly how to deal with emerging talent and i feel like there's there's a real gap you know maybe to someone you had on your podcast before on the education side mm -hmm. i don't know how we solve for that part of it because how like you know early in my career where I learned was sitting there watching people on the whiteboard as they were figuring out how to solve for technical problems or what was critical as measurements versus the things that are just extraneous data points that are not really delete. Like it's difficult to replicate that in a zoom environment. Like right. you just, it's not. So, so I wouldn't say that there's like a, a misunderstanding of why I think companies are pushing return to office now. I do believe though that there's some there's some hybrid there's some place where like if you're talking about the junior levels of the team yes they need to be in a talent hub they need to have peers they need to have mentors they need to be brought along if you're talking about more senior people that you bring on your team why do you care right like i'm right. probably taking premium and making them unhappy in the parallel because i do think at least from people that i know personally a lot of people took the pandemic and they said i'm out of san francisco i'm out of the bay area this is crazy right, right. they kind of went like little feathers everywhere <clears throat> and now they're trying to get dragged back in and they're senior enough that their you know companies are making exceptions for them right, right? um but it's not it's it's one of those like if i'm replacing them why wouldn't i also be able to get the right senior leader for that role why do i care if they live in des moines right like they should be able to live where they want yeah well i'd be suspicious if they moved to des moines but that's another conversation <laughs> um just teasing my grandfather helped great grandfather helped build most of davenport i remember many summers it's this weird dichotomy we were either because my parents grew up in the santa clara bay area but they were from the Midwest. They just got relocated there during World War II. And so every summer, and my dad worked for IBM, which back then mean, meant you moved everywhere. So we would, every summer, spend some time in Davenport, Iowa. Who knew it could get that hot? Or the San Francisco Bay Area, back when you could run from Redwood City up to Menlo Park and not get stuck in traffic. And it was a long time ago, probably horses were involved. But, it, um, <laughs> you know, where you're talking about um, this I, the return to work, we're, we're in the same spot and we have exceptions um, and it's important. We're just trying to be really thoughtful. The thing that we haven't figured out yet is we have a really great culture in our organization and it was built um, in community in a circle. I've said this many times on my show. I think you learn or you're introduced to learning and education topics in a row, in a lecture hall, in a church building or whatever, but you, but you grow um, in a community of people, most of us anyway, right, through training and drilling and doing a thing and um, moving, right? You can read a manual on driving, but you actually have to go drive and, and do it. Or you're sitting in a circle or at the whiteboard, to use your analogy before, with other people and kind of doing that. And so how we establish culture, I don't know that we have figured out yet, but I am 1,000% confident in the same way that technology is going to solve this problem, that it just makes the most sense, whatever that time frame looks like, um, that the talent pool, some portion of the talent pool is going to come from just our geographical area, complexities of regulation, complexities of border and whatever, and geopolitics notwithstanding, it's going to happen. When the industrial revolution happened, people didn't my, um, drive from the farm into town. They moved into town and they were very close proximity where they could walk um, or maybe ride their, you know, a horse or this, these new uh, fangled uh, buses or trolleys or whatever. And they did that until technology solved the problem. They can get to the suburbs. And then, you know, that's all we're talking about is sort of this ebb and flow. And um, when you were talking about earlier about your budget, 
look, we've got, I've got five great engineers we can hire. One of them's in Redmond. This is their price, and this is their skill level. One of them is in Moses Lake, very similar experience or whatever. Two are in, we'll go back to Iowa, you know, college, uh, whatever. So I've got this mix, and uh, a couple of them are outside our borders, one in um, Western Europe or Eastern Europe and one in Mexico. I've got this team that can bring this level of seniority, these different perspectives, all of these other things. Some of them are local, and so maybe we um, maybe we solve that by they. There's some mentor program where they come to the office once a year, but they're one fourth of the cost of hiring somebody from this community. You know, those are the. I just think, Sarah, that as time goes on, and and we have more and more senior executive leaders that are exposed to this dual idea of. We've got to create and maintain the culture and the belief that we want. We have a budget that we have to work within. I said two ideas. There's going to be three, but we've got to output. Um, we've got to output something, right? And so we've got to work within these parameters, and um, we're going to find a way. I, I, tr- I genuinely, I see it happening um, all over the place, and I think we get the best of everything as an organization if we do that. I'm not a CEO, so I don't know exactly how that happens, but. Um, I, I don't know. I think the people who win the most are going to be the ones that build that uh, paradigm. And probably people like you will be at the heart of it because you're a builder. And it's going to be chaotic and messy now. But we've seen too many fantastic results uh, by not doing that. And just imagine if you're that person who's not in Silicon Valley. Not to pick on Silicon Valley. I, I have many, many friends and family there. But if you're changing the life, not your 401k status, but somebody's life, in an unbelievable exponential way, man, you want to talk about loyal, all-in uh, human beings. I don't know. I think there's an opportunity there. Agreed. I think I think it's the untapped next level. And I think you're right. Like it's we're in build mode now because we're still trying to fit the old paradigm into the new. And I mean, there's some little reasons for some of it. Like some of it is balance sheet problems. Like, Hey, if I close out an office, I'm going to have to impair it. Right. You know, just like I would. And that's a fairly significant investment that I made based off of time frame where I was told I have to build up, you know, really like high end look I, in a high end location with high end benefits, et cetera. I think if you looked at where most people came from and the pandemic, none of those things mattered. It didn't matter to the mission of the company, didn't matter to the individual in a real sense, right? Because, you know, having snacks in the the refrigerator didn't benefit you when you were at home. Nobody was giving you a snack budget, right? right? But having, let's say, maybe an hour to two hours back of your day where you weren't commuting, I was just reading an article like the studies are in that time didn't go back to the individual. Right. That time wasn't like used like sitting on the couch. In fact, if anything, they proven productivity really did actually take advantage of that extra time. Like the employees, yeah. I've ever, hey, if I was supposed to work seven to, to six, because that would have been my normal commute time, guess what? I'm still doing seven to six. And I'm also doing my laundry and I'm also picking up my kids from school and like gave more in that process. And I feel like, to wipe that part of it out is also a big mistake. And I don't yeah. think that anybody, I think most people are trying to find this place in this delicate hybrid dance. I'm inclined to say, in addition to that, I want to see my leaders coming from all over the world. Right. I don't want team consensus, like where it's like, oh, well, unless you're here, co-located here or in the U.S. geography or in this place, like, I want to keep it as even feel as possible because I do know we saw it. We saw it practical, like resources that were being paid significantly less. Right. We're delivering significantly more. And I do think it's that alignment. It's that belief. And it was the visibility. They had they had a seat at the table because it was all Zoom room, virtual table. Right. Everybody had a seat then. Yeah. It wasn't like the old days where it's like, hey, we're all sitting in a conference room and there's four people on a Zoom and they're quiet unless they're spoken to or they have to answer a question, right? Now it's like everybody is on it. And even now return to office, I'm still seeing 
that level of engagement. I'm still seeing people participate in that way. And I, I, I'm going to, as a leader, continue to support and encourage that because I think it's it's absolutely essential. Anybody who has a real serious interest in diversity inclusion, inclusion means actually bringing everybody to the table. Well, yeah. you can't make everybody sit at a virtual table or, right. or I should say physical table. Right. So let's make it virtual. Let's align off of ideals and like specific visions and like people's investment. Right. And and then reward investment and deliverable, like because the combination is what makes companies like really successful, particularly when you're in a building or growth mode. Yeah, one of the things we haven't tapped up into yet, but I believe it's important to you, and it's directly tied to this: is in addition to expanding the pool of talent and and then elevating some of that talent to leadership, and and for the first time. In, in certainly modern uh, Western business, they have um, they have agency at the table in this leadership role. Is this is this idea of empathy, which getting into leadership? And I want to pause there for a second because people listening to this are going. Some of them anyway are going to hear that like, oh, here we go, it's going to go off the rails. <laughs> when I say something like empathy or um, uh, you know, having a leadership skill beyond just reading a spreadsheet and measuring growth uh, of product growth and deliverable. I mean, really connecting with the human beings. Uh, one of the things we do lose or did lose, we are getting better at it, but we did lose when we were remote was the drive by the, you know, just sort of our spidey sense, because we're used to body language and reading people and you can fake something. Um, you know, right now I'm actually sitting in a bathing suit in a baby pool. It's just my green screen. Not really. It wouldn't be a baby pool. It'd be a really big pool. But um, you can you can fake behavior for the camera for a little while, but in person it's very difficult. And we're getting much better as we get accustomed to the tools at, at doing that. But one of the things it seems to me that is as important as these things that we've been talking about is this idea that we have to be empathetic. And I don't mean not profitable. I don't mean unproductive. I don't mean naive. I don't mean measuring performance. That's not at all what I mean. Those are all ingredients um, in the recipe for a successful, healthy organization. But I do think that it should be a key ingredient of leaders today, one, that they have, and two, that it can be developed. Do you think the same way? And if you do, how, how have you thought about that? Yeah, I, I, I do think that it, in a similar way, like it, you know, going to the body language and how to read the room, et cetera. I, I think this is the point around some of the more, uh, let's call it developing talent or kind of junior resources, because I think even on a Zoom, you can you can see a tell. Yeah. <laughs> you, there's there's ways that people still you can still see, um, but I think it's it's more nuanced and it's more difficult than when you're like right there. And I think mm -hmm. you know not to get like metaphysical on it, but I think mm -hmm. that people feed off of energy, right? Like mm -hmm. you know I know I know some people who were like you know that energy that could walk in a room. Nobody knew who they were, mm -hmm. what they were about. And they could piss off everyone in the room before they even open their mouths, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm right? sure you no, have to. I'm, I'm sometimes that energy. <laughs> yes, I know. it. <laughs> but, uh, but I would also say like in a virtualized world where you don't have that same sort of biophysical response, like mm -hmm. you've got to learn words matter and choices matter and how someone is representing themselves matter mm -hmm. i do think though it goes back and and this is again that core lesson early on was nobody comes into the work to do a bad job even that person who's thrown off that negative energy mm -hmm. chances are is coming from some other conversation or some other meeting or has something going on personally etc so from an empathy perspective going to empathy mm -hmm. i think there's a place of putting yourself in someone else's shoes becomes like one of like call it a superhero strength because the moment that you can start to do that there's nothing you can't achieve mm -hmm. like truly because because if you can again understand where someone's coming from if you can create a baseline of like what your what good looks like what deliverables look like not from a like an actual like must include xyz 
because sometimes people don't actually know what they want. In fact, if you ask me, like, what is the lesson that I've learned in my 20 plus year career right now? I would tell you most of the time people don't know what they really want. Like that is it. Like, and as a buyer, that is a very difficult and terrible place to be in because I'm now trying to craft a multi-year strategy around something you're not even quite sure of. Right. Right. So, so you have to break apart the problem differently. You have to understand like, what are they solving for? You know, in the standards world, we used to have a, a, a thing we would say, nobody gets involved in international standards because they feel like it's a good use of resources. They do it coming from a place of fear or greed. Mm. That's it. Right. I'm going to be involved in the IEEE standard because I believe I have some unique way that I'm going to make some wireless application or some tool work, um, but I need enough people to agree on the core part of it so that I can throw my secret sauce on it and then be like a market leader two to five years out, right? That would be the greed. The fear comes from, I don't know exactly how to solve for this, but if I don't show the market that I'm doing something here, <laughs> I'm also going to end up being behind my friend. And my boss is going to fire me because I don't have an answer for, you know, call it the the soup du jour version of strategy today, right? right? And so so that fear greed meta still works today, mm -hmm. like still is a problem. Like, so again, if, if I'm meeting with um, a potential partner, obviously they want business, they want brand, they want, you know, our logo. Mm -hmm. That part is easy. Those are the easy part. Mm -hmm. But understanding what is driving their business, are they coming from a place of fear? Are they coming from a place of greed? Well, that goes to the individual, that goes to the company culture, that comes to the, the actual product that they're delivering. Like, are they cutting corners because they have to get as much margin because they've given you too much margin on the front? You know, I'm one of those people that, you know, I'd like to think I'm, I'm tough, but fair, mm -hmm. you know, reputationally, mm -hmm. I think been fed that information back. I would rather make a bigger investment on something that actually will give me value. Mm -hmm. Because if I take you to the lowest dollar or if I push some sort of strategy, I come from a place of greed. Mm -hmm. That is 100% how I'm operating. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what happens? You inherit what you build in that situation because they were too fearful to tell me the truth, mm -hmm. right? So they'll give me what I, what I said that I wanted, not actually delivering me what I really need or what I really wanted and not what they could actually do. So then we're gonna get into change management and there's relationship damage that comes from this, et cetera. Like you can always like extrapolate how that's gonna play out. But that's like in a buy relationship, but I would just tell you, even in your own internal teams, a lot of times people come from a place of fear, right? Understanding where fear comes from for individuals, why they come from fear. Well, may, hey, I have to do it this way because I'm, I'm going to get like hit for breaking a process and I'd already been hit and I don't feel good with my boss and I don't feel aligned. I mean, those are all real stories that people get into or greed. I, I'm I'm trying to get promoted, so I'm going to show myself as the thought leader in this project and so that people see all about me so that I can get my career motivated to go as far as possible. I'm not saying that is only metaphor like those are the only motivators for people mm -hmm. but i would say primarily if you start digging into any sort of real any conflict or any place where you feel you're misaligned you could almost point it back to some place where it's fear or greed <laughs> so if you're ceo of the organization um it could be public or private your choice you, it doesn't matter to me um you have different masters but um you have masters at some point and you want your organization to start with trust, not suspicion, to have this, um, you have to establish a common belief or idea that everybody can rally around so they can measure themselves. Like, do I want to, do I want to be part of this? Right. I think it's got to kind of start, um, there, what do we believe? And, and I'm on with that. So when times are tough and I'm rationing, um, I'm okay. And when times are, um, are, wildly beneficial i'm i'm I, i'm not hoarding right so so i'm i'm not working from fear or greed and i'm 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 managing through these things in a healthy situation and many times my experience you may have pockets of that because you have a intermediate level executive that really in their small group exemplifies that and to the degree that they have control but if you're the ceo and you want to 
you want this to permeate through your organization. How do you how do you get buy-in? You won't get 100% buy-in because you're going to have a wide variety of leaders. But the most marginalized people in your organization are for sure going to buy in because they they're marginalized. They don't have they they want to be um, they want to buy into something bigger than themselves. And the other is, it seems to me like this is a skill. I've heard this. Simon Sinek's talked about this. I've heard this many times before. Um, spoken about. It. I don't know that I've always seen it. But you, this these skills are skills you have to develop. You may have an affinity for them, but you have to develop and you have to have a culture in your organization of real learning and development, not a once a year offsite conference room with a really cool dinner at the end of it, but a regular um, a, a program that is easily to administer, that's not top heavy, that really brings people in. And it's not a it's not a mechanism to just kind of vent and talk about how the org's failing you or whatever, but really to develop these things. In some ways, believe it or not, the military does this um, w- well very often where they, they, they're constantly training. They're, they, they come back and they come into these organizational roles. They learn some, and then they go back out and train and drill, and they, they have this ebb and flow of learning that. I'm wondering how do you, if your CEO, get to – deploy something like that well i'll just say not being a ceo i'm gonna i'm gonna infer yeah. how, I, yes. how i think it work. but i would tell you um one of the most critical things i've learned over the years <clears throat> has actually been that um that the hiring process in and of itself mm. um because you can suss out people's motivators, right? So I think some companies are really deliberate in how they hire and they're a cultural element. Like Uber has, you know, like specific things we're looking for from a cultural perspective. Most companies do, or I think if they make a mistake is they coach you on it. You know, I, I won't name the company, but, you know, I was in an interview with um, so one of the top cloud companies today, public cloud companies today. And the recruiter made a point of saying, here's all of the cultural things that we look for. And you should know this top and back and forward and upwards and downwards. And I refuse to look at it. Mm. Now, you could say that that's, you know, as a, as a junior resource, getting that type of guidance, et cetera, is like probably critical to getting in the door or comparing yourself, mm. let's say, from other like g- recently graduated resources. How do I show myself as a little bit better? For me, I felt like, if I have to be coached to understand your culture and to like pair it back the culture, all you've done is train me that I can pair it back to you, but that's not necessarily going to be changing your culture. That's not like, I'm not a natural fit. That's a coached fit, right? Mm. So I think a lot of the tech companies do this style of here's our company mottos, here's like our values, here's our cultural things. And oh, by the way, we're gonna test you. So make sure you're prepared for that. I try to be a bit more organic with my team. In fact, I tell my my HR representatives, like, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I do think it's important for us to find natural affinities, a find an, an a aligned resource, not just from a skill perspective, but from that team culture. And looking at it, you know, you described your team, right? You have resources, you know, all over the map as a financial combination. I actually look at it as a cultural combination just as much. Mm. If I have a lot, in fact, early on on my team, I'll I'll share a little story. Early on on my team, I had um, here at Uber, um, was hiring a resource. That resource um, was perceived in the hiring committee as being slow. And I was like, what does that mean, slow? Well, you know, he just seemed really deliberate. Okay. And we're concerned about that. How well we were, we operate so fast. We we have to move. We're we are move fast culture. Move fast, break things was like a, a meta combination from back right. in the day, right? And they used it. They used just culturally like mm-hmm. suss people out based off of that. If you were like too process oriented in those early days when I was there, no way you would have got in the door. Like mm-hmm. now, that's completely changed. I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest it's the same yeah. magic, but. I would just say like, there was this place where I challenged my team and I said, look, as a team, you're going to have to live with this person. I will stand behind the team's decision here. But if you're telling me that we're just trying to hire more people like 
who, how we've been operating because we've had no choice. We've had to be reactive. We've had to be fast. We've had to build in like vacuums where there wasn't resources or enough time to do the things properly. So you're just building it as fast as you possibly can. Do we want to do that? More people like that. Or do we want to start bringing in some of the other things that we don't have, like naturally affinity in our team? Should we be looking at the diversity of thought? Mm -hmm. And maybe we want somebody a little bit more deliberate to, uh, you know, ask a qualifying question or slow us down a little bit, et cetera. And I stepped out of the room. I left it to the guys. I mm -hmm. really did. And they came back and they're like, no, I think we want to go for a team that has a bit more thought diversity. And I was like, great. I'm glad to hear that, right? I mean, but I really would have stood behind them because in the end, as a leader, your job is to enable people to work together. And yeah. I feel like at a CEO level, you have a bigger responsibility than ever to bring a culture of people who can work together and can work to deliver on that mission. If you have teams that are working against each other or competitive with each other, or this guy's hiring for really aggressive like kind of resources, whereas, and, and it's not necessarily job appropriate, right? Because right. I think you have a different skill set, like, let's say on a, like a business development person compared to an operations person, you, they have totally different mind shares. Right. But there's a cultural piece that you can start to ring into. And I think if you hire for the culture that you want, maybe not the culture you have, right. but for the culture that you want, you're going to start to see changes and you're going to start to find synergies and you're going to start to find any, I don't know, a, a team that's willing to take the hits. You know, our business got affected 90% in mm -hmm. Q2 because we're a B2C product, right? Mm -hmm. So on a consumer spending side, you know, the world got shut down globally, right? right. Who Whose business is really insulated enough to assume that? You, you assume by market, you could have a problem, et cetera. It was a global pandemic and nobody was outdoors, right? right. Like this becomes a real like existential threat for a company like Uber. Right. But structurally, I think what kept kind of got us through this was one, they made the quits like quickly. They didn't linger. They explained the why of it. They were very clear on what success looked like. So I think at an CEO executive level, like I'm going to always give those guys props for how they handled that. Yeah. I would also say like as a thought leader and as an org leader at my level, my job was to rally people back together. Hey, we took a hit, let's rebuild because we still have the core building blocks. We're still a team that was built off of like some ideas of like culturally what we're trying to achieve. And that doesn't just stop on my FTEs. Like even in our EXTs as we're proving people that are gonna be supporting our team we're looking for people who have a similar kind of cultural DNA. And I feel like if you start from there, you're going to find all the right talent. You're, I mean, are you going to get the brilliant bozo? Sure. Yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> you didn't but, have to stare at the camera so directly when you said that. Hey, you know, if you're feeling it, that wasn't on you. I would just say like structurally, everybody knows that it happens, right. Right. but I think it's how you recover from it, right? Like iterate fast, you know, fail fast. Like that's right. one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to talk to my team about is it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to iterate. It's when you kind of keep doubling down on a bad idea, that's when you start to really run into like the skids, right? So yeah. I'd rather you iterate. I'd rather you fail let's regroup, let's go a different direction. And that's everything from technical deliverables to like team and team culture and how do you bring people together? My favorite, um, I don't know how they would do it at CEO, but my some of my favorite leaders are great sports team leaders. And the best ones have mastered this idea of, especially, I'll just use football in this analogy, but I've got an offense, a defense, a special teams, I have support staff, like I... I've got wildly different shaped people. I have different talents that I need. I don't need a wide receiver defending the quarterback because they get destroyed. Like all these people. And I need somebody to be quick, instant thinker. I need others to look for trends and be more deliberate. Like I, but what, where it becomes a team is if they don't see themselves as a, I am, you know, player three on the offense or on the D. Like, that's my role, but I'm on this team. And 
um, when that Buffalo Bill player was injured the other day, very scary, and you saw this whole group, this whole community rally around him, and you, you heard the comments coming out of the organization about who he was completely separate from his position that he plays, just an average player, uh, well-loved, very involved in his community. They did a lot of philanthropic things and all these things. And what I'm getting at is his coach, one of the things that came out was the coach was like, look, we look for people. Um, they have to have a physical skill or they can't play this sport with us. Like that's a, that's a table stake. So there's a whole bunch of those people. I'm not looking specifically for that. I know we're going to evaluate and you're going to go through evaluations at position and whatever. What I'm looking for is in that group, who is, who, who from a personality, one, they have to get into my core mission, vision, and idea. They have to be all in with their heart. And two, from an emotional perspective, what don't I have that's healthy, but what don't I have? I've got a couple people in that position, and they they tend to be more like this, more, more deliberate, and I don't have any kind of intuition, quick response. And so they build these really things, and they then they coach them. Like there's coaching involved, and they um, and I think sometimes we get caught up in the if they don't in on first impression, um, I don't know, fit some predefined paradigm. How many in sports have we seen people succeed that when they went to some combine or some measurement, they were Tom Brady famously was marginal at best in his um, evaluation before he became a quarterback. And I know that's the unicorn, but there's so many of these stories. I think if you've got a heart as a leader of, like they have to have whatever the experience and the technical capability, um, but we benefit as a team, assuming those things are true and we do our, self, we do our evaluation to get a little bit personality. And I would just end with, I, I got... Where it really shifted in my mind, I was at a CTO conference in San Francisco of all women, and I had them at, I was a moderator, I was sitting at the table with these eight leaders, very, very bright ladies, and um, I just asked them, look, if you've got a talent pool, and the top three talent happen to be men, and they are off the chart in every test and measurement, why would you, don't you think it's artificial or disingenuous to hire the sixth one out of that talent pool if it's a woman. And they said, almost to a person, it depends on the team. So if I have a team of primarily men and I need somebody at the 92nd percentile at a minimum, and I've got five guys at the 98th percentile and seven women at the 92nd percentile or above, I will go hire that woman every single time because she is more than equal to the task. This isn't just we, women empowerment. This is this is um, for this team. It makes the most sense. And because they have a different perspective and they have these other things and their life's experiences, measurably, demonstrably, measurably, performance and outcome is going to be so much more significant than if I just got one more 98% guy. We're not anti-guy. We're not even sacrifice the team to get a gender or a uh, some diversity class on here j- just so that we can be a social advocate. No, what we know is that healthy teams look like this so long as whatever our minimum, minimum performance standards look like this, you benefit um, in the long run. And then we iterate as we need to. And I, as I thought about that more, I didn't believe them. I am ashamed to say at first glance, I thought, ah, you're just telling me. And I went and did it and it, all the data says that is exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been some more recent studies that come out talking about, you know, um, differences in gender roles or even like a minority experience is going to just bring a different experience factor to the table, right? right? If you, um, and, and I feel like, you know, just in my own microcosm, you know, I have that opportunity to hire, you know, from very great brands, right? Mm-hmm. But if I were only hiring people that, you know, let's say had similar pedigrees to myself, I'm going to miss a huge opportunity, to be honest with you, because some of those pedigrees come with their own blind spots, right? Yeah. And I think from a team perspective, when you start to think about a team dynamic, um, or even how to make DNI like a real thing, not like a fake thing, but a real thing that you're doing. 
the core of it comes from understanding that like, hey, maybe that minority person who had to double down to just get out of their situation, to just get a seat at the table, comes with a resilience that frankly, maybe your 98% men would mm-hmm. never have been able to come yeah. with. Like, right. because their lives were very different. Their foundation, their backgrounds, like their opportunities were very different than somebody who's walking in the door. Um, and it's funny because like, you know, similarly, I hated DNI plays. Like I, I, I frankly won't sit on a DNI right. panel, right? right? Like women in tech makes right. me angry more right. often than not. Um, but I do think what is important in this story is that as a leader, you have a choice. Every time you putting a hiring decision in place, what are you feeding? What, what, what is the culture that you're bringing? What is the energy you're bringing? What is frankly the spirit that you're bringing to what you're responsible for, for your company, for what you're delivering to the company? What, how does what you're doing actually change the company? right? Mm -hmm. If you're critical to the service, like QTS is critical, like the engineering ops side, right? Mm -hmm. You know that that becomes the impression that every customer walks away with. It doesn't matter how much beautiful marketing, you know, Mm -hmm. no offense to the wonderful people at QTS marketing or sales, right? You know, you can't sell something that can't be operated well, Right. right? So there's this place that it says, if you understand your role and how coordinate it is to that delivery, then you get to a place where you know that every headcount matters. Even the junior guys that are coming in the door, I'm creating a world where I'm now coaching and bringing somebody up who's most likely going to leave in two to four years Mm -hmm. to go to the next great opportunity. But that seed is actually one of the coolest things you can do because if you bring together the right people and you train them and you give them the right thought leadership, well, they're going to go into next leadership roles and next companies. And I kind of, I don't know, I've been floating this idea about the spark, you know, mm-hmm. this idea that every person introduces a spark. That spark can be for good or for bad, mm-hmm. right? So you, you're you part of a team that has terrible culture. That doesn't mean that you have to accept that terrible culture. You can actually be a part of the change in right. that culture, you can hire the next great person next to you who is also going to help buddy up and be a part of that change. Alternatively, you leave and you go to your next gig. You know, the grass is not always greener, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is inappropriate to align yourself to people who have shared beliefs or common values or like, again, you know, you can believe in what you're building. Because I think right. once you have that and you know as a leader that it's your job to put something into the foundation of that, then it's important to you. The people part of it becomes absolutely critical to how you, you move forward and how, and how, what you're doing is far more important than whatever today's deliverable is or what your salary is or what your title is. Yeah. We started off this um, conversation and we're, we're out of time, so I'm not going to, um, I want to go down the road of innovation. I'm just going to have to press upon your, uh, um, good graces at some point uh, later this year to talk about innovation with me. But you started off this conversation with the idea of um, culture and leadership starts at hiring. And I love that. And it reminds me of a very good friend of mine recently retired as CEO of Accenture um, Digital, Mike Sutcliffe. And we had a similar conversation and I don't remember if it was on camera, it might have been off camera, one of our many conversations, but he was talking about the types of people that they hire. And they they try to do this cultural, at least in his group, his organization, all 48,000 of them, like, how did you interview all those people? But he tried to, he was one of the original, um, you know, Arthur Anderson kind of 40, almost 40 years there. And what he said was, you know, you'd be surprised at how many times we hired amazing people from pretty much any school you could imagine you would want top half of 1% of any Ivy League anywhere. And we had and still have wonderful people in our organization from all of those Brown, Cornell, Yale, Columbia, whatever. Amazing. What's really interesting is equal to maybe even greater than success with state school kids. To your point before, these kids, and he's not 
harsh against the first group or saying if you come from a state state school, it was an automatic indicator of your performance. Because again, they try to screen really hard for culture and idea, depending upon the role and the big idea of who they were, um, at least on his watch. But as often as not, when they got into these really tough situations, the people that had not had to struggle as hard, either because their mind had just worked in a way or their economic situation was such that they didn't have to fight for things in the same way that that kid from uh, Northeast Georgia or Iowa State or whatever, you know, not a big uh, Division One or um, uh, Ivy League school, and they went through some stuff. They had to work three or four jobs. And he said that that in and of itself wasn't like um, an indicator, but it was a co-indicator of these things. And he said, we're amazed over and over and over again. If I've got a team that has enough of a certain cadre of thought from a certain school, I know what I'm going to get. I know what they've been taught. I might have even helped teach their professors. I'm going to deliberately expand my horizons or sift through to find some of these other, because these, these men and women just come in and they fight and they stick it out and they handle they handle correction many times better. They handle redirect many times better. They're humble, not all the time, not trying to castigate the first group, but it's just a really interesting phenomenon. He said, 30-something years of doing this, it's a, it's a consistent trend. And that it just remi- this our conversation today reminds me of that diversity of experience that can help shape this out. Absolutely. And I wish like any leader listening to this if you're not thinking through your own hiring process, if you're just following the script, if you're just trying to plug the hole as fast as you can with the great candidates that come through or that you can afford to come through, maybe this is a call to you to like double click because you are delivering DNA. This is a cellular level to these companies. And if you're not If you're not happy with where you are delivering at a high level, or maybe you are happy, Mm -hmm. either direction, Mm -hmm. you got to feed the beast with the right level of talent. And and talent is measured based off of a lot of vectors that I don't think are always a part of your traditional hiring practice. And I think, you know, again, I, I hope that we are in a verge of a very different type of worlds, you know, where we really are empowering people and we really are bringing on global diversity and really enabling like these thought leaders to show up everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I believe it. I mean, I'm seeing it in real time, right? It's yeah. only been a couple of years, but I already see it and in real prime practice. So I'm excited about where the next five, 10 years go from this. Sarah Keller, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for coming on today. Oh, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Well, that's uh, it's been a great conversation. If you've liked it uh, or enjoyed it, please like. If you loved it, please subscribe. We'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. Take care, everybody. <laughs>